Thank you very, very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. I really think that Norway is going to be the green capital of the world, the green, not only the green capital, Oslo, but also the green country of the world. I think you people have the money, you have the culture, you have the will, and, uh, and I hope, I'm sure you will succeed. So I'm going to widen a little bit beyond the climate change only goal because we're talking about something much more important. We're actually talking about smart green growth becoming the source of innovation for the new good life and for a prosperous society. So it isn't just let's solve a problem, it's use that problem to solve all the other problems of the world, the socio-economic problems through doing this. So uh, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. Why we can think of this whole green growth agenda as an agenda that goes much further than that. So uh, this is what I will argue today. I will argue that because of the ICT revolution, the future is digital and it is global and nobody is going to stop that. You cannot stop information from being global and therefore you really cannot stop the world from being global, the, econ the economy from being global. And of course, digital, it's obvious that it is going to be. At the same time, the thing is that if we want to successfully confront the challenges of slow growth and unemployment in many countries of the world, it must also be green. So we're talking about digital and green and global together at the same time. I'm also going to argue that all this cannot be done by markets alone. There is no way that it will happen without policy guidance and really strong, imaginative, bold policy guidance, not just a little bit. And perhaps most importantly, I want to tell you that Europe can take the lead in building the smart green future. I really believe that Europe is in the right position. As you well know, the Chinese are all copying the American way of life. We have one planet, we don't have six. So the Chinese and the Indians and everybody else cannot have the American way of life. That was just all wasteful and materials and energy and all the rest. So we need to change direction for the world, but somebody has to begin, and I think you people are best placed to do so. So. What's happening? Huh? Why now? Why green? Why Europe? That's what I will say. So it's now because all my studies of technological revolutions, all my knowledge of historical experience shows that we are now at the appropriate juncture for shaping the future. There have been five technological revolutions in 240 years, so there is enough variety, enough revolutions for me to have been able to study the regularities in them. The first one was, of course, the Industrial Revolution in England. That was the world when the introduction of machines, factories, and canals. And think of canals as the first interconnection like internet. It was really for goods and for information to travel very easily. And that was the first revolution. After that, we have the age of steam, coal, iron, and railways, and telegraph. It was, that was the Victorian boom. Both were basically in the UK, but then comes the third revolution, and the third revolution was the first globalization. It was the age of steel, cheap steel, to do all sorts of heavy engineering things. Civil engineering, bridges, uh, tunnels, high skyscrapers, electrical engineering, First time we have big electricity, chemical, naval. You people set up your electricity in that during those times. So that was the third revolution, the first globalization. And that was the time when we had all the emerging countries, like today we have China and India. We had the US and Germany forging ahead and the US then taking over. And, but also 
Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Argentina, uh, Uruguay, Chile, all the Southern Hemisphere countries, because in two weeks with steamships, instead of sailing ships, you could travel from north to south. So you had this enormous um, global economy. Then, with Ford's Model T, we begin the age of the automobile, oil, plastics, and mass production, the one, the legacy of which we are now having to try to get rid of. But it was wonderful. That was a time when, for the first time, even the working classes became middle-income consumers. So it was a wonderful golden age, what we had thanks to mass production, mass consumption. Now we've got to change. Every time we advance, we advance in a different way. And we have now our own age of information technology and telecommunications. Now notice that it's only halfway. It really is only halfway. Looking at the pattern of propagation, which I will show you now, we are now in the middle of the information revolution. We're not at the end. Lots of people are talking, where is the next revolution? No, no. This revolution has not yet given us everything it can give. Each brings a techno-economic shift and a socio-institutional shift. And the techno-economic happens early. It happens in the first half. But the socio-institutional has to happen now. The welfare state was created after the, during the second half, after the war, after the 1930s. And that's what we need to do now. That brings new directions for innovation and the potential leap in productivity across the board. What I have seen is that there is a regular pattern of propagation. The historical record shows that every technological revolution has gone through two periods. The installation period, which is mainly financially led, the deployment period, which is led by production aided by the state. And in between, there is something that I've called a turning point. So you go from finance to production. So what we have really with each technological revolution, we have the eruption of the technologies, then we have a bubble prosperity. Every single one has had a bubble at the end of that first period. Then it collapses and we get a recession. Then we get a golden age prosperity, which is much better than the bubble prosperity because it involves everybody. And we finally get to maturity and the game starts all over again because we need another revolution to make another leap. So the first one, we had canal mania, canal panic, then a short period and then the Great British Leap. Then we had the railway mania in the second revolution, railway panic, a short period, Victorian boom, when the aristocracy actually supported the capitalists in order to get going. Then we had, as I said, the London-funded global booms all over the world, especially in the South, but also in the US. And then again, a few years of turning point, and then we go to the Belle Epoque. The Roaring Twenties was the bubble of the age of the automobile. And then we had the longest turning point. Actually, the name turning point doesn't fit anymore when you have 13 years of which you have a depression and a war. But after that, after all that horror, after all those soup kitchens and poverty, and after all the horrors of the war, we get the post-war golden age, the biggest boom in history. After that, we get the dot-com boom and the global casino. After Thatcher and Reagan had gotten rid of everything that made the golden age before. <coughs> then we have, this time, two bubbles. I warn you, we might be having a third bubble before we get out of this, because politicians haven't understood that they've got to change, that they've got to take over, that they, they've got to guide the market, because finance is in the middle of a casino. So the first half is led by finance, and we've had enough of that. The second half would be led by production and the state, if and only if the state actually 
takes the lead. So we are there. And the possibility of a sustainable global golden age is ahead of us. We've got to construct it. What does this mean? This means that the adequate historical parallel for today is the 1930s. We are in the equivalent of the 1930s. Now, what is the nature of the turning point? As in the 1930s and now, structural unemployment, de-skilling, hopelessness, inequality, casino finance, they just play, they bet, and they just do not invest in the real economy, therefore we have low investment, except for the, for the uh, tech guys in California, there's very little investment really going on. You people fortunately have more than others. Feeble growth, social unrest, populist messianic leaders, remember we had Hitler, Mussolini, we had also Hitler, the whole, and we had Stalin. So in fact, um, anarchists and all sorts of things, why? Because of the hopelessness, because of the inequality, of course. We also have xenophobia, economic migrations, talk of secular stagnations, the first time it was ever used as a term to refer to the economy it was in the 1930s by Alvin Hansen to the Economic Society, saying we can't grow anymore. Now this is, realize that. That was said in the 30s, just before the biggest boom in history. So really, forget about secular stagnation, it all depends on us. Then, of course, recessions and even depression. The thing is that there is a huge underlying potential, technological potential, which lacks a clear synergistic direction. That is what we are seeing now. The possibility of using ICT in the direction of green to transform the whole economy and the whole way of life is right in front of us, and we're not doing it. Golden ages result from providing an adequate direction. We've got to choose the right direction to enable the unleashing of that potential across the whole economy. And each golden age, and this is very important to understand, each golden age involves a lifestyle change. And, it, and that becomes the aspirational good life. Remember that sometimes when we're talking about climate change, we are stoking fear. You know, oh, we're going to have trouble. The world is going to be terrible. We've got to do something. Let's act before we get climate change. Or some other people about the lack of water or this or that. We're going to have lots of people dying. We're guilty. We've been using all this energy. If you have this attitude, we're lost. We'll never construct the golden age unless we manage to make it, to make it be understood as the good life, the luxury life. If we change to green, we're all going to be prosperous. And this is true. This is not inventing. You never change people's attitudes towards their whole life if it's not because it's aspirational and wonderful. People have to want this life. And that is what I'm going to argue today. So what was the golden age at other times that people wanted? Well, in the Victorian living, urban Victorian living from the 1850s in England. It was an alternative to the aristocrats living in, they had a, a style of life in the countryside. The capitalists that began, the manufacturers, all these people moved to the cities and created this new way of life. So that was the direction. And of course, England also became the workshop of the world. Now, for the third surge, it was the cosmopolitan way of life the Belle Epoque in Europe from the 1920s, from the 1820s. And then we have suburbanization, the suburban, the American way of life, the wife in the kitchen with all this factory and the whole, you know, the, the, the American way of life, all, everybody living in suburbia, everybody in a car, the, the going to the shopping mall, uh, that was entertainment, shopping mall over the weekend, TV, on the couch, eating frozen dinners. I mean, that whole thing was 
the good life. And people aspire to it. We can laugh now. But I can tell you, because I lived through it, we didn't laugh. We really thought it was good. I even remember the uh, nylon shirts, which made me very hot, but I thought it was wonderful. I just washed them at night, and the next day I, I didn't have to iron. Wow! So, you know, every way of life has its things that make it aspirational and good. So, that means that each lifestyle change brings new opportunities for innovation, for investment, and for jobs. The old way of life, that's what's being produced in China. So what are we going to do? It's obvious that that's not where the opportunities lie. That's not where the innovation is. So what is really, how do we get the unleashing of golden ages? With two things the emergence of a new lifestyle, and an active state redefining the playing field, tilting the playing field in a direction where everybody can innovate, everybody can be profitable, and people can live well and happily, thanks to that tilting of the playing field. So what does the new lifestyle do? Because you redefine the new aspirational good life, generally initiated by the young, the richer, and the more educated, you signal demand for complementary services and goods. So lots of new things that you demand with the new way of life. And the state provides the direction for profitable innovation with the new potential, which finances as risky, by the way. That's why they're not investing making demand available for the necessary production scales. If you think of the welfare state, it was a way of putting money in the hands of people so that they could buy the things that industry wanted to produce. So in fact, it just went around, you know, and you paid the taxes and the taxes went to the welfare state and the welfare state became demand and demand became supply and so on. And it just went around. And reversing the inequality, at least some of it, for the sake of justice and or social peace. In some places, they do care about justice, but in others, they're just worried about unrest, about violence. And we better start worrying now because it's getting pretty bad. And lots of people not only are voting Trump and Le Pen and all this and Brexit, they are also going to ISIS. I mean, how could we believe that people that are born and bred and gone to university in developing countries, in advanced countries, could go cut heads in, in the Middle East? It's so difficult to understand. Well, that's happening, so we've got to do something about it. So both these things determine the level of growth and job creation. Something to understand and not so easy to understand, is that the proliferation of jobs to serve the new lifestyles are what's typical of golden ages. The post-war boom in the USA, if we look at that graph, that goes from 1921, which is the beginning of the big uh, roaring 20s, uh, to 1969, 70 actually, which is the end of the golden age in the US. Actually, in, um, in the rest of Europe, it went up to 70. To the 70s. So look at that. If you look after the World War II, you see that manufacturing, which is the height tech sector, not every single company, but basically manufacturing was the high tech sector. Look at that. It only increases 30% in labor, from 15 million to about 20 million. The rest of the economy multiplies by three. So they go from the same 15 million to 40 million in just retail, trade, government, and services, construction, transport, utilities, real estate, insurance, etc. They all grow in workforce. But the wages were good, because the wages are made of the average productivity. So you don't pay, you know, you don't have the distinction like that, because societies, especially because you have a social 
way of doing it, you uh, actually have prosperity for all, whatever necessary job they do. What this means is that actually high tech provides the best jobs and the productivity and the wealth to pay for all the rest of activities. So we need artificial intelligence, we need robotics to create in a part of the economy a very high society, uh, a very high level of productivity and wealth. But that only happens if there is a clear direction for innovation and investment and a fair social covenant. You've got to have a social justice policy so that that extra wealth that's created in one part of the society actually does not trickle down, it is shared in a fair, natural way by having good wages and good, uh, a good well-being, welfare society. Now, why green? First of all, let me redefine green growth for you, because there are so many definitions of green growth, so let me give you mine. Green growth would be a constant increase in the proportion of intangibles in GDP and in lifestyles. By multiplying the productivity of resources, rather than just worrying about the productivity of labor, and improving the quality of life of the great majorities. So that's what, for me, is green growth. Notice the notion of intangibles. It's turning, making sure that you turn products into services rather than what mass production did, which was to turn services into products. So it means, specifically, to put the accent on care, preventive health, exercise, creativity and experiences, shifting to services rather than products, favoring renewables versus fossil fuel energy, obviously, developing and using biodegradable, degradable biomaterials, drastic reduction of waste, massive increase in reuse and recycling, making durable products truly durable, and shifting to a rental model. You know, really, people buy durables on credit. So they're really renting, because by the time they've finished paying, it breaks down and you have to start all over again. So in fact, we're renting, but we're making believe we're buying. Possession, possession, possession. We've got to stop that. We just need access. We just need to use what we need when we need it. Then we can rent it, we can use it, we can take it back, we can borrow it, whatever. Have a different attitude because possession is nothing. It's happiness that matters. So we shift to a rental model and we then seriously introduce maintenance with 3D printing of parts. No more parts production that are just going to be wasted and thrown away because if they're not needed, we just build each part as it's needed by printing it. So people would have to have the rental, people would have to have the software, and so on. So since this is a natural direction for information technologies, we can call it smart green growth. So I really propose smart green growth, not just green growth, because we need to recognize the role of information technology. Now let me just give you a taste of the transformation spaces for the smart green production and lifestyles. We're talking about an aspirational good life with less energy and materials, more ICT and more jobs. So the human-centered services, health and care, leisure and sports, entertainment, mobility and distribution, diversified electricity, an education industry, which has to be much wider than this kindergarten to, to a PhD, and then people exit at different parts of the, of the economy, and then that's it. You're sealed forever. That's what you are. No way. We have to have a very wide, flexible, lifelong type of education with a lot of institutions, not only the public standard ones, we need to have many others and we need to use the MOOCs and flip the classroom and do a million things. Education is one of the places where the transformation has to be the greatest. 
the arts, of course, all of them, intermediation between people and computers, sharing and barter, conservation, logistics, maintenance, resource recovery, recycling, and reuse, pollution reduction, and so on. How about modernization of production? The circular economy, truly durable products, 3D printing, rental model, nanotechnology, renewable energy, batteries and carbon capture, new construction methods, bioplastics and custom materials, fiber to the home and Wi-Fi infrastructure, smart electrical grid, complex systems engineering, hydroponics and urban agriculture, and so on. I mean, that list could be about three times longer. So massive innovation and massive employment next to robotics and artificial intelligence in sustainable activities enhanced and enabled by ICT. So, that means that we would have massive innovation and massive employment next to robotics and artificial intelligence in sustainable activities. Did I say that? Enhanced and enabled by ICT. Okay. So the smart green, sorry, the smart green shift in lifestyle has begun as always among the young and at the top of the income and education scale. So we have natural instead of synthetic, we prefer the natural now, minimalist design, gourmet and organic food, unprocessed, exercise for well-being, small rather than big, multi-purpose products, working from home, solar power and electric cars, intense internet use, low carbon footprint, durability, high quality versus quantity, repairability and upgradability, anti-waste, pro-recycling, customized versus standard, services versus tangible products, active and creative, pro consumer versus passive consumer, we now act as producers and consumers at the same time, sustainable source products, sustainably sourced products, fair trade and social responsibility, etc., etc. It does not spread by guilt or fear, but by desire and aspiration. That's the good life now, the luxury life even. Further spread, though, is going to depend on cost and marketing strategies on the part of companies. But it also depends on profitability, because otherwise they wouldn't do it. But profitability depends on the policy context. So in the end, it's government that begins the whole thing, with society pushing, with business pushing. So the whole thing has to be pushed from the bottom. Now, why Europe? Well, the new production and lifestyles are only slowly emerging. Why? Because each new paradigm must at first be still wrapped in the old. You know what that is? That's an automobile. It's an automobile in the early times when it was built by the same people that did horse carriages and therefore the driver is holding the wheel that way instead of this way because it's like the way he used to hold the reins and of course the engine which is below him is measured in horsepower. So that's how things begin. They look like the old but it's already the beginning of the new. So. Also, because relative prices of energy and labor still favor the American way of life. And now that oil prices came down, they favor it even more. And the Chinese, of course, want it and so on, so it's happening. So consumers and businesses will only respond if and when the context is changed by intelligent policies. Now, Europe, I believe and I understand, I come from the other side <laughs> of the Atlantic, so Europe is much less committed to the American way of life, I assure you, even though you might think not. It is in need of a competitive area of specialization to succeed in the global economy. The smart green lifestyle is already being defined and adopted by many, especially in the Nordic countries. And so are the production methods, the circular economy and all these things. So what is needed is the systemic alignment of the policies. The playing field needs to be tilted towards sustainability to achieve the necessary synergies in suppliers, skills, services, and in dynamic demand. That alignment is going to require at least consensual policy, which we already have, coherent and convergent regulation and fiscal policies, empowering local governments for synergistic action in the smart green direction, Commitment of public funds at all levels for green-related R&D infrastructure and investment, giving signals to encourage the private funds to do the same. 
and updating engineering and technical skills policies, emphasizing sustainability, which I believe you're also doing, and making economic policy across the board become smart green innovation policy. What am I proposing? That Europe should become the test bed for smart green innovation. That made in Europe from now on would mean healthy, safe, environmentally friendly, sustainable, reusable, recyclable, best tech, high or low, it doesn't matter. It's best tech if it's from the Nordic countries, best value, advanced production standards, a sign of good living, and the same with engineering, education, and other services for development. And the Nordic countries can forge ahead, and I believe among the Nordic countries, Norway can forge ahead. The American way of life defined prosperity for the 20th century. The European way of life can define prosperity for the 21st century and export it to the world. Thank you.